Today I'm talking about the number 5 Mark III Mills bomb, probably the most important grenade of the First World War. Hey, thanks for checking out my video. Today I'm going to talk about the number 5 Mark III Mills bomb. As usual, I'll be using uh, things from my own collection to make my points or try to, and I'll talk about the condition of my grenades later important grenade of the First World War and probably the 20th century, in my opinion. 75 million were made and they stayed in production for over 60 years. So this is William Mills. He was an industrialist who owned uh, factories and had some important patents related to aluminum, but he had not created arms until the First World War. Leon Roland and Albert de Wandre were Belgian citizens who worked for the Belgian Munition Company and as early as 1912 Roland had patented an internal ignition grenade. The British Army had showed interest in and when the Germans invaded Belgium Roland was locked up as a prisoner of war but his partner Del Wandre was in England and working with Mills. There was controversy and a lawsuit after the war in regards to the patent. Uh, that's William Mills' first patent from 1916, actually. It doesn't look like the grenade that was in use, but the core concepts are there. And here is Roland's grenade from 1912, a patent drawing. They didn't actually get to build one. The idea is that it's all self-contained. You don't have to light anything outside. It doesn't depend on impact. It has an internal percussion that starts the fuse. So you can uh, compare the two and make up your own mind or do more research. That's not what this is. This video is about, that controversy. Here is an example of one of the early prototypes. They tried, uh, they presented their first prototypes to the Army in January of 1915, and it didn't work that way. And here's an example of the number five mark one that made it to france for trials in april of 1915 they really didn't have enough of them to use until 1916 of any type of mills bomb so uh let's look at the design and why it was so important uh, you know a grenade when you see one right so fair enough this is what everyone thinks of as a grenade now, and the features that it has are... The features that it have come from this grenade. Uh, all grenades for the last hundred and some years have basically owed a lot to the influence of the Mills bomb. So, uh, it has a lever or a spoon, this part. In America, we call that the uh the spoon in england they call it a lever uh and that is held in place by a pin with a pull ring and you'll notice the typical striations on the outside there uh for fragmentation now originally the mills bomb was created uh, that was just for grip. It actually had, inside of it, it had like that. That's a number, uh, that's a number 15 lemon grenade uh, in relic condition. But if you can see inside there, that is to create fragmentation. And the Mills bomb had that inside as well. The outside was just to get a better grip on it. But it did create a lot of fragments. It is what we call an a defensive grenade and if you've watched my other videos you're familiar a defensive grenade means that the fragments are the casualty radius is greater than you can throw it someone could throw one of these about about 30 meters uh, 100 feet uh, but they were lethal fragments uh, big chunks of metal were dangerous well beyond that range so you wanted to be behind cover when you when you threw one of these a defensive grenade okay so, so how do you use one of these? Well, you've seen movies. You do not pull that with your teeth. It's way too hard. As a matter of fact, before you're about to use them, 
you're going to straighten this out. It comes from the factory with the, with the pin bent. But before you are going to use it, you'll straighten that out so it's easier to pull. Even then, they issued, I'll show you a picture, they issued a hook whose purpose was to allow you to pull this because pulling it by hand is hard. When you pull that inside, this spring, inside, this spring remains cocked. This is a real one. I've got a weaker one in here and I'll show you the action. That remains cocked. It's safe. It's not going to blow up. The, uh, the delay train has not started. Delay train is a fancy, uh, a fancy term for for the, the series of events that uh, lead to the explosion. So, pull the pin. Wow, kind of hard. Okay, now I need to keep gripping that, and I need to grip it firmly, the lever. If I let go of the lever, like that, that just went down. I have five seconds until this blows up and ruins my whole day, if it was real. Uh, so, Ideally, you let go of that when you throw it. This flies off, and five seconds later, it blows up. Uh, so it's a pretty, it, it's a lot safer and easier than impact grenade, and it's not going to blow up until you let go of the grenade. That's the idea, anyway. There were some problems in uh, in, in the mark uh, in the number five Mills bomb that they corrected in later versions that I'll talk about. So let's take it apart. Inside, there is a channel. It was brass in the uh, number five. And inside sits this. This is, okay, so the spring has the striker in it. And the striker is like the firing pin of a gun. This is the real one. It has uh, 30 pounds, about 14 some kilograms of force. So I broke, um, I broke my original um, striker uh, using that before, and you need a tool actually to, to to compress it. So now I just use that that little spring for demonstration purposes. But that sits in the top of the channel here. This sticks out the top. And that little rim, if you can see that, that right there is what separates you from a bunch of fragments and an explosion. Uh, they fix that in later models because that is really precarious. And if you don't hold it extremely tight or if this has play in it, uh, they had a one in 3000 failure rate uh, in, the, in the number five. Mills bombs, which is absolutely terrible. In modern grenades, it's one in a hundred thousand failure rate is borderline unacceptable, but there were a lot of accidents. Okay, so when the spring goes down, it hits this. This is like the percussion cap of a gun. Uh, there are two little bumps on the bottom there. They hit this, and it's a percussion cap that creates a spark that burns this fuse. This fuse should take five seconds, a uh, variance of half a second uh, was acceptable. Fuse burns up to this. This is basically a little metal firecracker uh, because these were filled with barbitol or amitol, uh, which is ammonium nitrate uh, and a mixture of ammonium nitrate and a TNT-like explosive. And so it's a stable explosive, high explosive that needs a blasting cap or a smaller explosion to set it off. You can drop it, you can burn it, um, you can hit it with a hammer, not recommended, it won't blow up, but if something blows up inside of it, and inside the channel here, the spring was in the center, the detonator and the fuse went like that in the bottom. And these were inserted at the, at the front at the time that they were gonna be used. I'll show you a video here of people loading them. Very tedious, very dangerous uh, because you're loading. They had a tool and you put the fuse in 
they came from the factory with the explosive in there but you don't ship explosive and, and detonator together as a, as a recipe for accident, especially when you're shipping thousands of them. So they had to take the, the base pl plug off and put the fuse and detonator in. And they did that by the thousands. You'd sit there and do that for eight hours a day. Um, a few notes about the striker. This is a reproduction striker, and you'll notice it's got a little groove in it there. This is an original for a Mark V without the, the notch. And this was a problem because the gases didn't vent. When it came down inside of this, there was no place for the gas to go. So when this detonated, and sometimes that would cause the fuse either to go out or burn more rapidly than it should. So in 1916, they went to this. Uh, so there was some of the, the gas that came from the detonation of the percussion cap could escape. Now you know that. Okay, another note. This is not an accurate, this is not uh, accurate for the Mark V. The original uh, Mark V levers or spoons uh, had a, I'll show you a picture here, had a ridge down the middle and the very first uh, number five Mark I actually had a separate hole um, uh, for the pin to go through the spoon as well, or the lever as well, a hole right there. I'll show you a picture. Totally unnecessary, it caused a lot of extra uh, work. So why was this important? Uh, I talked a little bit about our Belgian friends and Mr. Mills, but before uh, the Mills bomb, the British were using something awful like this. This is a relic hairbrush grenade in relic condition, and you light it with a match, or it's basically a pipe bomb on a stick, right? They, they were field improvising grenades in 1914-1915 and then they issued the uh, the number uh, 15 ball grenade and it's a very bad grenade uh, to ignite it it's got what's called a Brock fuse on there and you pull this off and then you have to strike it on like a match or the lemon grenade number 16 uh, is an improvement on the 15 has a different Brock fuse mechanism that's supposed to ignite um, you can uh, the strikers actually in there and you can strike it like a match before you throw it but there uh, you're in the mud in the rain trying to light a match to throw at the enemy not a good solution uh, the French had the Citron Fogue and there were a number of like uh, of grenades like this that you had to hit on something hard and that would trigger uh, that would trigger the delay train. Again, you're in the mud and dirt, what are you gonna hit it on? Uh, also, all of those grenades have no fail safe. When you're using a, a Mills bomb with that lever, you can pull the pin and wait an hour, not recommended, or you can even put the pin back in, again, really not recommended, uh, because it's dangerous, you might get it wrong and it might blow up. But there are all kinds of situations where you want to throw your grenade, say you have a Citroen Fogue, and you see the enemy, bang, you have four and a half seconds, five seconds before it blows up, uh, but then a shell lands next to your position, throwing mud and dirt everywhere, you've got a live grenade, uh, you, you're in trouble. You have to get rid of it because it's going to blow up. With this, you wait till the moment the shell blows up. If you don't lose grip on it or get knocked down, you're fine. You can wait until your moment of opportunity when you throw it because the delay train only starts when you throw it and the plunger comes down. That's a huge improvement over what had come before. And we still use it today. So the number five Mills bomb was the, was the first version that, that it came out in well they first reached the troops in may of 1915 
it wasn't in big enough numbers to make a real impact until late 1915, early 1916. Uh, how do you tell a number five from a number 23? Uh, very carefully. Uh, the, the 23 Mark I was basically the same shape, very oval. I'll show you pictures. So I believe this is a Mark V. If you think it's an early 23, uh, let me know. Uh, you can tell it very easily from later, uh, the 23 Mark II and III because they had a different shape at the bottom and the number 36 had a very uh, narrow bottom. Why? Because the number 23 was designed for being used as a rifle grenade. The number 23 uh, Mark One was basically the same shape, had the same top uh, as the uh, the number five, uh, but it had a different plug that allowed a rod uh, for the first cup discharger and you would fire a blank from your uh, Lee Enfield and this would be in the barrel and uh, fire the grenade. So that was the primary difference of the 23 Mark I. They started out as zinc, these base plugs, and I've got two original examples here. Having, if you get a, a Mills bomb somewhere and you're deciding what it is by the base, plug you're probably going to be mistaken because they were interchangeable and even when they stopped making the number five in uh, May of 1918 they had leftover a uh, base plug so they were issuing other grenades with these if you can see here this one I don't know maybe I show a picture of that this is dated 1916 and this one is from A. Bellow and Sons. They have the maker mark and it says number five, uh, mark three. This one is from Falkirk and it's earlier. It's from August of 1915 and it also says number five, mark three. You can see there were 66 different companies providing uh, parts and pieces and assembling these which caused some of the problems uh, with the number five they standardized a lot uh, with the number 36 and even in the later models of the 23 but these are not quite the same there's quite a bit of variance there in, in what they look like so not a good thing um, what else the filling plug okay so I've got a partial uh, here uh, again it's a number uh, number five Mark III, I believe, it's in relic condition. The number five had a small hole here that was plugged with a brass plug, and that was at the factory. They filled it with uh, barbital or uh, a, mon a monal. Uh, the explosive was put in through that hole, and then they screwed it back on. It never came back off. And when you find relics, oftentimes it's hard to get that out. So in the later, uh, in 23 and the 36, that got bigger, easier to fill, and it moved down the front of the grenade. I'll show you pictures. People ask me, how do you know this stuff is safe? Well, I know something about explosives, because I used to blow stuff up when I was a kid. Yeah, well, I lived in the country. It was, yeah, never mind. Anyway, uh... But I'll show you a picture of what these looked like when I got them. Uh, I got them about 15 years ago from eBay France. You can't do that anymore. I'm gonna put out a video on collecting these things. But they were balls of rust and I used a lot of elbow grease and a file to get rid of the rust and restore them uh, to the condition that they're in. This one I left a little bit rougher. This one I filled in some of the holes. It's not perfect, but if you have a mint one, you're lucky uh, because you cannot ship them uh, by mail or basically or by airplane anymore. 
as always thanks for watching uh likes appreciated please click subscribe if you want to see more about grenades and if you have comments or corrections those are important too see you next time Here's a few things that aren't in my collection or were impossible to show. They shipped to the front in cases of 12, and they had in the center there the fuses that needed to be inserted, and that on the lid is the tool that it would use to remove the base plug. And here are some soldiers uh, putting those uh, detonators in. And here's the tin that held the detonators in that case. As I mentioned, the number five was plagued with a lot of issues in the beginning. The brass being the brass issued this, blaming the soldiers for not knowing how to use them, and that's a little card that shows them how to use it that came with them until 1916. They also issued a lot of training grenades. This is an example of an early one. But most of those problems, I think, were more related to the manufacturing issues they had and the variances and before they worked out the kinks in the design. I did not show you an accurate pull pin for a number five uh, grenade. That's a picture of one. Sorry about that. Don't have one. So how powerful were they? Well, uh, a couple have been blown up in recent years by the bomb squad. And that's one blowing up uh, in a field in England a few years ago. And you can see sandbags being thrown there. Uh, here is another example of one that was found in Ireland and blown up uh, by the bomb squad. So quite a powerful blast, but again, blast was not the purpose of this grenade. It was designed as a defensive grenade that threw fragments 